Welcome to this video on passive or active immunity. I'm going to describe the differences. So passive immunity provides short-term protection. I need to turn my flash off. Short-term protection. Whereas active immunity provides long-lasting protection. So that is one important way that these are different. Let's highlight those in blue. This one is short-term protection. This one is long-lasting protection. For passive immunity, the host will receive antibodies. Usually in nature, this is going to be a baby receiving um, antibodies from its mother. So the host receives uh, antibodies from some other source, so from another source. And let's compare that with active immunity. In active immunity, this will occur when the, it, the host's own body makes the antibodies. My dog is dreaming. I don't know if you can hear him. And my washer and dryer have been going today, so it's kind of noisy around here. So this is when the host's own body makes the antibodies and its own lymphocytes form memory cells. So then you're going to have the ability long-term to respond. So let's compare those things using our orange highlighter. So Passive is when the host receives antibodies from another source. Active is when its lymphocytes make the antibodies on its own, and not only that, but they form memory cells that can attack down the road. Okay, so the first example I'll give for passive immunity is via the placenta. So IgG antibodies, these are the ones that circulate in the mother's um, bloodstream, pass or cross, I should say cross the placenta. And enter the baby's bloodstream. And so this happens mostly, or I should say the most, in the third trimester of pregnancy. And it will protect not only the baby while it's in, the, in utero, but also after birth, during infancy. Now it does depend on the IgG antibodies and we don't always know why, but IgG antibodies to something like pertussis seem to um, like die off in the baby, break down in the baby. Um, they have a very short half-life of a few weeks to a few months. And then um, like antibodies to measles that the mother had seem to last um, longer. But what I think is super cool about this is the mother's environment is what the baby will be born into, right? And the mother has antibodies to the most common problems in that environment. And so she is protecting her unborn child and then her newborn baby from um, any common diseases that are in the area um, just through these IgG antibodies crossing the placenta. So here, let's use a pink highlighter to color her bloodstream. So this is the mom's blood. And her um, blood contains antibodies. And they're, uh, we're talking IgG antibodies here. And they cross, so here's the placenta. They cross and they go into the baby. I'll just use um, maybe yellow for this. So the antibodies cross and go into the baby. Pretty awesome. But that is not um, the last way that the mother protects her baby. Um, why don't we color this one in green? So placenta IgG, that's the main idea there. Okay, now this could be a topic for, oh, I don't know, a whole semester of learning because breast milk is the bomb. It is the best thing. So. Let me tell you a little bit about what's so cool about breast milk. First of all, it contains 
all different kinds of antibodies. We usually hear, like if you were to read about this briefly, you would hear about IgA antibodies. So it contains all classes. So their antibodies come in different kinds of classes. Some protect on mucous membranes, some protect against parasites, some protect in the blood. But the breast milk contains a little bit of all of these. But the one that gets the most press uh, is especially IgA. So this is the antibody that our bodies make that then hangs out on mucous membranes to protect from things like respiratory infections and GI diseases. But um, in babies then that are breastfed, it's helping to protect them from diarrheal diseases. But there's also IgG, IgM, IgD, IgE. All of these can be found in breast milk. And then this part is super cool. But get this, breast milk, all milk actually, contains white blood cells. And these white blood cells, this one represents like a macrophage, a phagocytic, and this would be like a lymphocyte. White blood cells, all kinds, and they seem to act a little differently, which I'm not gonna get into in this video, but they are they act uniquely when they come out in the breast milk, and then they're in the baby's gut, and they actually release all kinds of chemicals, I'll put those in blue, that help to um, bind up any um, pathogens that might be there, and get this, they only seem to bind up the bad ones, and so by doing so, they make room for the good flora to um, proliferate and really fill up that baby's gut with good, normal flora. One of the most famous uh, kinds of chemicals that might be found in that um, breast milk is interferon, and that will protect from GI viruses. So that will protect from viruses because it um, makes it so that the viruses can't get inside the baby's cells. And then this is all manner of chemicals, all manner of um, immune chemicals. Um, and I have a feeling we've barely gotten to know the beginning of the science about how well this works. And then another thing that I think is super cool here, I'm going to use uh, maybe a purple, is that it appears that these chemicals stimulate the baby's lymphocytes. And I'm even going to put the word train with a question mark. I'd like to see more research on this in the future to find out what's going on. Some of these chemicals stimulate or train the baby's lymphocytes so that the baby's lymphocytes are potentially primed for whatever is in its um, immediate environment that the mother is living in. Now, not I'm going to come back to this because... This then could potentially be an active form of immunity. Now, if you're taking a T's test or you're answering a typical question, they're always going to tell you breast milk is a passive form of immunity. But because I like to be creative in my thinking, I can't help but think that if you're training that baby's lymphocytes to know how to make antibodies better that are more effective, that sounds like active immunity to me. Um, so then, oh, and I also want to say that the uh, white blood cells are especially um, common in, or in the, most common in the colostrum. That's that first milk that the baby has, or that the mother makes. But it, they're still present in all, uh, even if the baby's two or three years old and drinking milk, there will be white blood cells in there. Okay, then the third um, kind of passive immunity that I'll talk about on this page you can highlight immunoglobulin injection in green. And this is if you are exposed to something that you don't have immunity to and could kill you pretty fast, like rabies. They will give you an immun immunoglobulin injection. And remember, immunoglobulin is just another word for antibody. So they can um, have antibodies that are primed to, to attach to the rabies virus, for example, and then keep you from getting rabies if you're exposed. So, for example, um, after rabies exposure. And that's only going to be short term as well. 
Okay, so let's go ahead now and look at some active forms of immunity. Basically what it comes down to is that exposure to the pathogen in everyday life and assuming the immune system works appropriately, makes antibodies, makes activated cytotoxic T cells and then develops an army of memory cells. Then exposure to the pathogen in everyday life, why don't we use um, purple on this side, would be considered development of active immunity and a natural way of doing that. Then another possibility is exposure to some part of the pathogen in a vaccine. So in almost every way, exposure to the pathogen in everyday life will be advantageous uh, or it will be better for you than getting it in the vaccine form if it's possible to be exposed to it and not have a high risk of dying before you develop immunity. Also, when you're exposed to it naturally, it goes on to the location of your body that it would be normally, that your body's best at fighting it. So it would be, um, um, your, the exposure would be via the route you're best at responding to. So what I mean by that, if it's a GI virus, it would end up on your GI mucous membrane. If it is a bloodborne uh, pathogen, it would then end up in your blood. If it's respiratory, it would be on the respiratory. Whereas a vaccine is generally just injected straight into your bloodstream, even if normally you would encounter the pathogen on a mucous membrane. And sometimes they'll have you, they will put it onto a mucous membrane or like, um, rotavirus they'll have the baby drink it so that it goes naturally onto the mucous membrane so they're getting better about that with vaccines too but in general uh, this would be the better way assuming again it's not too dangerous of a disease so um, e.g. mucous membranes okay then I'm going to spend the rest of this page giving you some vaccine examples and what part of the pathogen they include so the first uh, type of vaccine might be a live attenuated virus. Attenuated means weakened. So they're going to inject or put onto a mucous membrane a weakened form, weakened form of the virus. So some that you would have heard about with that would be the MMR vaccine, measles. So it has the measles virus, the mumps virus, and the rubella virus all in one injection and each one of these is a live virus but it's been weakened uh, so that it shouldn't make um, an otherwise healthy person sick and this is a good example of not necessarily going on to the same route so these infections generally are respiratory um, like droplets is how people are exposed to them and it's given in an injection straight into the bloodstream so that's not totally natural and Potentially, maybe it has an effect on um, the body's response and maybe the risk of um, side effects and things like that. So let's go ahead and highlight that in um, yellow. So if you could have a live attenuated virus, there's a lot of these different ones. And then if it's a bacterial disease and there, then you can't give a live attenuated version of the virus. Um, so instead, what is really common for some of the most deadly diseases would be deactivated toxins. From the pathogen. Some of my favorites for this would be um, Corinibacterium diphtheriae. And it's the toxin they're giving a little piece of that protein toxin in that injection and then the body makes antibodies to the toxin not to the bacteria bacterial cell so not to the cell but to the toxin that the cell makes and that is how you're able to be immune to it so the toxin then won't make you sick so if the cells are there then they're harmless to you or I would imagine relatively harmless so that's a second way. And then another um, toxin one 
is to tetanus disease. So, and that is a bacteria called Clostridium tetani. And this is an endospore forming bacteria. It kind of looks like a tennis racket. And it makes a toxin that then the, that toxin, a, a, a part of, a, sorry, a form of that toxin that has been deactivated is in, injected into the person and then they make antibodies to that. So there's another example of the toxin. Okay, and then the third um, common part of a vaccine would be part of the bacterial cell. And these tend to be a little more controversial in how effective they are. Uh, pertussis is a classic one that gets a lot of news for maybe not working as well as we would like it to work. And this is to protect people from the bacterial disease, Bordetella pertussis. And it contains little, um, so it's little pieces of the cell. And then another one I was just thinking about, Streptococcus pneumoniae. There's a, what is it, a PCV13, I think is the most common pneumonia uh, vaccination. And both of these are um, not always effective. My personal thought on this is because these are cell pieces and they're going to be more capable of changing out their antigens and being harder for our immune system to consistently recognize. So cell pieces would be the special part here, cell pieces. And then the last thing I want to say on this page is to tell you what an adjuvant is. This is something that is added to the vaccine in addition to the cell pieces or the toxin or the weakened virus that is particularly irritating to the immune system. And hopefully the, the reason they do it is they're trying to get a stronger immune reaction. So an adjuvant is a substance that is known to be hyper irritating to the immune system. Oops, immune system. Added in an attempt to get a more robust reaction, like better antibodies, more memory cells. And these can also be controversial, especially if the adjuvant is something like a heavy metal, like mercury, which is not in very many, or aluminum, I think, is in a lot of them. Um, and those things are um, particularly irritating to our immune system, no surprise, right? And so if they can make the vaccine effective without adding it, that's going to be better as far as reducing side effects. Okay, thanks. See you in the next video.